Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker betting show. This is the Masters 2021 preview. I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm delighted today to be joined by two of the very best golf tipsters in the game. That's my opinion. I think it's probably yours too if you're somebody who follows these guys on Twitter, on social media, and all of their previews as well. Odds Checker's very own Niall Lyons and Ben Coley making his Odds Checker. Well, not debut, because he actually joined us on the phone for one of these about four years ago, Ben, but your kind of debut in, in person, let's say, on this show. Thanks very much for joining us today. And Ben, I'll start with you, because uh, your preview content on Sporting Life um, and, and that's just to say nothing away from Niles, which is also superb. But I kind of feel like when your stuff starts coming out, when your player profiles especially start coming out, then you know it's really time to get excited about what's coming up this weekend. It must be an unbelievably busy week for you in terms of getting all this stuff out. Yeah, I, I guess um, the the busy stuff is, is in the weeks before, isn't it? You know, um, hopefully after today, uh, <laughs> I can begin to relax and, and, in, and just enjoy the tournament. But yeah, it's a busy few weeks. I don't know what I was thinking about four years ago when I decided to profile <laughs> every player in the tournament. But um, I can't very well stop now, although I'm running out of jokes, as Niall will tell you. So um, at some stage, I'm going to have to draw a line under things. But uh, that, no. that's, that's why I love it, because it's, you know, it's not too often you get kind of good preview content crossed with humor i mean I, I kind of imagine that you must have to be you must have like a dossier of players like a football commentator and have notes written kind of during the year on each one so when you get to this stage you have your your stuff all prepared oh i wish i was that diligent and prepared no it's all in <laughs> all in my head i'm afraid i do have the occasional moment where i think oh that'll be funny when i write it in a profile in four months and send myself a text message or an email but that's about as um uh, as uh, planning as I get. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty off the cuff, which is uh, one day one of the players will sue me, won't they? Paul Laurie <laughs> once, um, I think I, I wrote about Paul Laurie for ahead of the Open a couple of years ago and and wrote him off and he retweeted it with, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. And, and you know, he took it in the right spirit, but I got an army of Paul Laurie fans telling me who was I to disrespect <laughs> the greatest Scottish golfer of the whatever, you know, which which is probably fair, but they're all tongue in cheek. You've got to take it in the right spirit. Do they, do they have names? You know, you know how you have like believers and stuff. Do Paul Laurie fans have a nickname? Or, or do, do Laurie we... loaders, let's call them that. <laughs> Laurie loaders. <laughs> The lorry load is coming after you. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I'm sure we'll talk about it more during the show, but anybody who is watching or listening to this who hasn't read Ben's, uh, all of Ben's preview stuff, but certainly the player profiles, uh, you're missing out because it is fantastic stuff. And, and Niall, you know, I've, I've built Ben up a lot there, but if you're an odds, odds checker listener or viewer, you know all about Niall Lines. And fair to say, Niall, you've had a cracking start to the year tipping-wise and another winner last weekend. Yeah, probably last weekend was one of the sweetest, that, that, you know, Sometimes you back hundred to one pokes that win. Sometimes you back twelve to one shots that win, and the twelve to one shots are a lot sweeter. I think it was a lot sweeter for many people. It's actually great to see, obviously Jordan Spieth back winning, but it's even better to see the support form. Like I think maybe a couple of years ago, me and even Ben, we probably thought we were the only, you know, big fans, kind of bigging them up every week and trying to tell everybody how much of a genius he really is and I think everybody realises now and the, the entertainment value he brings to the game is just a, s completely special now on different levels so uh, yeah I think I think last week was great for the game and great for this week's Masters as well Yeah absolutely I know a lot of people who wouldn't normally watch the Sunday of the Valero Texas Open were glued to their second screens watching it uh, on Sunday evening as Jordan Spieth returned to the winner's enclosure for the first time since Birkdale back in 2017 uh, where he broke my heart that day. But anyway, we'll move on and um, we're going to be going through. So we're going to start with Augusta, as we always do, talk about what kind of a test Augusta brings, what kind of players we're looking for, and a little bit on how it's going to differ from the Masters last year, which of course took place in very different circumstances and conditions back in November. It doesn't feel like too long ago. Then we're going to go through the favourites at the top end of the market and speak about whether or not you guys have put up any of those. Uh, spoiler alert for those people who, uh, for those who've already read Niall and Ben's columns, that a couple of those are the headline selections. We'll then run through the rest of your tips before looking at a few players to fade, a couple to swerve, and then into the sub-markets to finish as well. So plenty to get through. And Niall, you're you know the, the home team here, so we'll start with you uh, about Augusta itself. And there are a lot of myths, or maybe not myths, but there are a lot of kind of, if you speak to anybody who watches the Masters, whether they watch 
weekend golf on the PGA and European Tour consistently or if they just watch the Masters, they all have an idea of what it takes to, to win a Masters, whether it's being a great putter because the greens are difficult, whether it's the approach play, whether it's having to have a a high draw off the tee. In, in your opinion, which of these are the most important to keep in mind when you're making your selection? Well, you know, drive and distance, approach <clears throat> play, um, around the greens and on the greens are all those aspects are all more important at Augusta than they would be at, a, at an average PGA Tour event. Uh, the aspect that doesn't really matter as much around Augusta is uh, accuracy, which is unsurprising, really. The, the punishment isn't as penal as other courses, especially major championship courses. So you can afford to go offline, kind of like Texas last week when you've seen Jordan Spieth go offline plenty of times during the week. Uh, I actually think it's an ideal preparation now, having having watched Texas last week. But you know, you find the trees and you kinda need to thread the eye of a needle to you know, hit a low punch shot towards the greens. Plenty of times that's what you're gonna get at Augusta if you go offline. But again, if your short game can make up for it and you can get up and down, uh, you know, that's obviously gonna be very important over the week. But the, it's accuracy that really isn't important around here compared to the average PJ tour event. And obviously, driving distance, you know, it's always favoured the bombers here at Augusta. I think that what you mentioned there about a high draw, I think I, I wrote that in the preview that I think that's uh, that kind of thing is getting thinner and thinner by the year. Just with, with well, what Dustin Johnson done last year, uh, he showed what he can do, what what you can do with a long half. And as I mentioned, you know, Colin Morikawa has kind of a low phase where he doesn't have the length of what Dustin Johnson has. But if you have a fade, you know, akin to Dustin Johnson's or Brooks Kapka, I think you, there's absolutely no doubt that you can score around here at Augusta. And, you know, you don't actually need that, you know, high draw or even low draw, say, that Patrick Reed has. I think Dustin Johnson's, you know, slowly put, you know, the burners on that, on that narrative. Well, you mentioned Dustin Johnson there and Ben on your preview I loved the beginning where you put the quote from John Rahm the advice offered to Sebastian Munoz where he says anything you learn today this week forget it talking about how you know maybe because the conditions were so different last November compared to how Augusta normally plays come April how much can we read into Dustin Johnson's win last year how much can we read into the winning score how much can we read into the clutch of players in behind Johnson the likes of Sung Jae Im of Cameron Smith uh, of Abraham Anser, especially when we considered that there weren't any patrons at Augusta in November and even though it won't be as full as it usually is there will be a level, you know, there will be crowds there come come the weekend too. So is it a case of drawing a line through November? Um, and how is this test going to differ to that event? Yeah, I, I think it's probably the case that Ram's line is is a nice line for to start a preview on or, or to write copy around. But, um, you know, I wouldn't really be thinking you'd forget it all. I think for someone like Munoz, you know, you've, you've driven <laughs> through the gates and you've experienced being on Augusta, you've 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 understood. You've stood up, stood on the tenth tee and looked down at the the undulations across the course. And um, as I wrote in my preview, you've, you've stood on the twelfth tee and you still got to pick the right club and judge the wind and all those things. There are things you can learn, but in terms of how it will play, um, you know, chalk and cheese. I, I think it, even based on Monday's press conferences, uh, everybody. Adam Scott said the greens were as firm as he's seen since two thousand and seven. Um, Kevin Kisner said it. You know, and he's played here a lot away from the Masters. He said he, he's never seen them like this. And I think we saw it in the Augusta National Women's Amateur last week that they were already got a tinge of brown to them. And, you know, the 17th in particular, if you were if you were through the back on 17, it was really hard to get the ball close. Um, so I think, you know, when we were watching the Masters in November, I, I think all of us would, would have recognized that it wasn't the normal Masters mm -hmm. in any way um, and that balls were stopping um, when they hit the green. Uh, so many shots into the 15th, for instance, that would have come into the water or even gone through the green um, that during November's edition, they stopped. And it, it, I thought it was quite interesting that Adam Scott said, actually, it helped the shorter hitters. And there were quite a few shorter hitters um, in the mix in November. Sung Jay's not the longest. Cameron Smith, Abraham Anser um, was in the mix as well. Webb Simpson was 10th. Um, Adam Scott said that actually for those players, yeah, you're hitting longer clubs in but you can stop them. So you can hit a three wood into the 15th green and stop it. Whereas yeah. 
this week, you might find that it bounces through and into the water just ahead of the 16th tee. So yeah, a fundamentally different test to take nothing away from Dustin Johnson. You could have played that on concrete and he'd have won. You know, he was the best player in the world at the time, wasn't he? So um, yeah, a, a very, very different test. But for those who've been there, it's still experience they can rely on to some degree, I imagine. Nali, are you agreeing with that? So it's worth focusing on the fact that some players had the experience whilst not necessarily putting too much faith in, in how the leaderboard looked come Sunday afternoon when making your picks for this weekend? No, well, I, I I can consider it quite relevant simply because it's played out, uh, you know, player-wise, how you would think. You know, obviously Dustin Johnson was, a, was well, he was alongside uh, Bryson DeChambeau favourite-wise favorite going into the mm. event, but, you know, you'd... Uh, Dustin and Thomas, Rory, Kapka, all who made the top 10 in the end, and Ram actually. The exact type of players that you would expect to uh, play well at Augusta and have played well at Augusta before. So I think the way the course played is obviously different, but the result didn't play out any different than what you might think, bar the, the kind of three debutants that made the top 10. And as you say, we don't know, but there's a possibility that you know the lack of crowds made a difference there with those guys I don't know if it if it did or not I can't come to a conclusion on that but at the same time the result played out what what you would expect so uh, I think it's relevant in terms of looking if, you, if you're if you're a course form if you if you study course form and, and things like that but, you know it's no real different than any other result wise anyway just before we get into the players themselves, um, sometimes, you know, I'm a big believer in the data side of things across all sports. And, and often I've been told by certain football fans when I've criticised their team's performance based on expected goals, I'll be told that football is played on grass, not spreadsheets. And, and I guess the same can be said for golf as well. And, and some people won't like the introduction of certain statistics like strokes gained, um, which effectively is, is a similar idea where you're looking to compare um, a player's performance from beyond just their score in terms of what they're doing. But for those who do like to look at the data side of things and want to know what kind of a test Augusta brings, um, and I know that both of you guys are probably more based on, on you know, having read a lot of your previews, you, you do nod towards the statistics, but are probably more based on feel um, and knowledge of the players. So w- what would you say would be the key data metrics that, uh, that people should be looking at here? I, a stroke scan approach is probably the number one for me. I, I think a lot of people will tell you Augusta is a second shot golf course. Um, as Niall said, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to be in a conversation off the tee. Um, there are ways to, to overcome that. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard. You know, Augusta is a closed shop, isn't it? And, and mm. we don't have easy access to the data. It does exist. Um, people like the 15th Club, who I know you guys have worked with a lot, um, will we'll have that data. And I've managed to get hold of some from November, but it's really difficult and it's frustrating that we still live in the dark ages a little bit um, with regards to access to it. I mean, why it's not just plastered all over the Masters website, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, what data we have tells us three of the six winners since they started collecting strokes gain data here actually led the field for the week in, in approach play. One of the interesting things I think is that so many of them had, had been hitting the, their irons particularly well in the run-up. So Dustin Johnson had been twice the leader in stroke scan approach in his five starts prior to winning here. Uh, Tiger Woods had been the leader in stroke scan approach at the Valspar before he won it. Patrick Reed had actually been the, the leader in stroke scan approach at the same tournament before he won it. And Reed isn't one who often would lead that statistic. Um, and while I think everyone who watched it will recognize his short game was massively important to his win at Augusta, uh, he didn't actually hit a lot of greens. But when he did hit greens, he was hitting the ball close a lot. He had a lot of close range birdie putts. So strokes gain approach for me is the number one statistic. And um, and it brings you back to my headline selection. But I think it, it also underpins the improvement in Jordan Spieth's game recently. And it's why he seems to have timed things to perfection I, I think it, whoever is in the top five of that statistic will have a good chance to win the masters right let's get into the players then and before i do so just want to point the listener and the viewer to the direction in the direction i, sh- I should say of the odds checker app very important for this tournament because not only can you see the best prices but the best place terms as well you've got skybet playing Skybet paying uh, 11 places, a fifth of the odds, 11 places. Then you've got firms like Bet Victor paying just six places. So you do want to shop around and make sure you're getting the best combination of price and place term for your bet. You also get the best bookie offers, free bets, 
and some of the best tipsters in the game. Uh, Niall's tips up on the app and across racing and other sports as well. An important uh, thing to have in order for your, your betting resource. But at the top of the market <clears throat> is last year's winner, Dustin Johnson, who is nine to one pretty much across the board. Bryson DeChambeau is 11 to one. Jordan Spieth, 12 to one. That stand out with Sporting Index. Uh, John Rahm, 12 to one. Justin Thomas, also 12 to one. Roy McIlroy, 18 to one. 22 to one Cantlay and others bigger than that that we'll get onto a bit later. Normally, here we would start at the top and work our way down but we're going to skip the first two and come back to them and go to Niall your headline selection and interestingly when when Ben and I were texting yesterday about planning for this I just asked if I could you know maybe get a bit of an insight into who would be tipping up so I could plan the pod and he told me he was going to be tipping up Justin Thomas who we'll be talking about in a second and I said oh great because Niall's actually going to be tipping up Justin Thomas too that's not happened So Niall, talk us through your decision-making process yesterday and your headline tip, four points each way, Jordan Spieth. Yeah, well, yeah, there's no doubt that I've been persuaded over the last uh, four or five days after Texas to actually back him. As I told you just off the air, I got a a, a few quite bigger prices during the year, but uh, at the same time, I think now I should be favourite. Dustin Johnson, I know we'll get on to him, but it doesn't quite convince me lately. And Jordan Spieth is just a model of consistency since, you know, Phoenix Open, where where he, uh, I still call it the Phoenix Open, by the way, I'll always call it the Phoenix, <laughs> uh, where, where he just, you know, burst right back onto the scene. I think he shot a 64, and he, that consistency has remained. And now, as Ben mentioned, you know, approach play, strokes gained approach is so important coming into Augusta. And he's flying on that front. In fact, it's his third best season on tour uh, to date. Uh, strokes gained approach. Uh, of course, his history with Augusta is there for all to see. There was actually a period uh, in between 2013 and 2015 where he led the Masters after seven of nine rounds in a row, which is just absolutely incredible to think of. And he only won it once during that period, which is another crazy stat. Uh, he led after round one in 2018 as well when he was playing very poorly in the running. It's a lot different now. So consistent. He's had uh, you know, three top fives in his last six bar. That was before Texas at the weekend that he won. Uh, you know, on putting he actually hasn't hit the heights putting wise than than what he did when you know in a so called pomp a number of years ago. So I think he, there's still uh, a ceiling to reach there on the greens. I think there's more putts to be held and uh I think what was telling over the weekend is that, I mean, he said so himself that, you know, holding them putts under pressure, you know, is a totally different story to as to when, you know, he was playing well in, in the run up to Texas, actually holding them putts when he needed to, and when he was under pressure from Charlie Hoffman, is, uh, you know, what'll give him confidence if he gets into contention this week, and I think the way he drove the ball, especially on the back nine on, on Sunday, will give him huge confidence that when he does get into contention. That he can find the fairways, and I think if he finds the fairways, this like I'm enjoy, like obviously Spieth will miss plenty offline. And, you know, I'm well prepared for that, and those who haven't backed him are probably well prepared for it as well. <laughs> uh, you know that he he get out of trouble so many times, uh, but I do think that everything is aligned now for a, a big challenge this week, and there's negatives surrounding a few others in the market, uh, not least the favourite Dustin Johnson. That I think. For me, uh, it should be the shortest price of the lot. There was something refre- refreshingly spieth about the way that he closed out as well. Uh, you know, laying up with an eight iron and duck cooking it left before, you know, hitting his approach shot over a tree and straight over the flag. Um, you know, that those moments of kind of mercurial brilliance that we that we've come to know. And I guess Niall, to before we, we do move on, I mean, it's interesting to see on the exchanges over the last kind of 24 hours, he was he came into about 11.5, I think, just behind Dustin Johnson. He's now back out to 14. So he's about the same price as he was going into the last weekend. And he's now got that win under his belt. So do you think there could be scope for those people listening that that could drift out a bit further and therefore maybe wait until come Thursday morning if that continues and he could be, could be getting a bigger price? Uh, so don't think he can trust much more than that, to be honest. But uh, I think there's plenty of people out there now saying that he's too short of a price, which I don't really agree with. Uh, 
you know, you take everything on its merit right now, you know, and we're advising people who to bet right at this moment in time. Mm-hmm. Not uh, Some people are kind of clouded that, you know, their judgment's clouded that he was 50 to 1, you know, three or four months ago and 25 to 1 a month ago. And But we're looking at the market now, and for me, you know, I have a slightly different, different opinion than other people. Other people might disagree, but I think he should be favoured. And I wouldn't count on him drifting anymore, but the more he drifts, the more he'll have. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Jordan Spieth, the four point each way selection uh, at 11 to 1, because with 11 to 1, you're getting a few more places. Hills, nine places, I think, is the best you're going to get um, for your Spieth bet at the moment. Uh, ben, um, on to your headline selection now. It's another one towards the top end of the market. Uh, 12 to 1 best price at the moment, and it is Justin Thomas. Talk us through why Justin Thomas is your four point each way headline selection for the Masters. Yeah, I guess similar to Niall, I think we've probably been through very similar thought processes and <clears throat> and, and just come down the, on the other side, you know, because I think Jordan Spieth, for me, has an outstanding chance and uh, I could easily have, have put him up myself. I, I came down on Thomas, I think, you know. Obviously, winning the Players' Championship, that's the best tournament we've had um, for a long time, you know, probably over a year, actually, um, in terms of the field strength. Um, I know some of the big names underperformed, um, but the way he played, I mean, he he won that without holding a putt, really. Um, and he's done that a lot. I mean, when he, he won it Southwind um, last August, lost ground to the field with the putter. Um, he won the Tournament of Champions at the start of that year. I think he ranked 13th out of 30 players in putting as well. So um, he's not someone who needs to light up the greens, which would be the worry here because in, when a mas- the Masters have been played in April, he's yet to gain strokes on the greens. But I think that tells you how much untapped potential there is there. Um, the key for me is that every year since his debut, he's hit loads of greens. He ranked 11th that week. Every, every time since, he's been 6th or better for greens hit. I don't think there's anyone bar Spieth, I would say, who's more comfortable here um, in terms of hitting the shot shapes. And, and and He said it himself, he's learned that you don't, when he's got a 9-iron in hand, he's learned to actually back himself. And it's actually contrast to something that Patrick Cantlay said yesterday. He was still talking about maybe being a bit more defensive, but Spieth, um, sorry, Thomas, <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> T- Thomas has said, you know, look, I, I realize now if I'm in the middle of the fairway with a nine iron, uh, I need to go at the flag sometimes. And um, I, I, I just think he's he's timed it perfectly. You know, he had a tough start to the year um, for for reasons including self inflicted, as we know. Um, but he he got that win at the Players, a very emotional one for him. I think it's the best win of his career, really. I, I know he's won the US PGA, and and that's what he'll be remembered for. Um, but but in terms of field strength and in terms of significance, I think probably the players would would rank number one. Um, I'm not worried about the match play. I think he's the best iron player in the field, along with Morikawa. But Morikawa, you know, does concede an experience uh, gap. And the thing for me was, you know, twelve to one. He went off twelve to one in November when I put him up, and he, he finished fourth. Um, he had a great chance that week. He let himself down on the back nine on Saturday. Um, mm. He felt he hit it really well and just didn't get the luck, but he ultimately didn't produce for that for that run of holes. Um, but to be the same price, having just won the players, I thought that was kind of maybe a little bit generous. I, I don't think the market's going to be way wrong on anybody here. We're talking about the Masters, a very mature market. You know, it's it is what it is, but. Um, I think he's got a better chance now than he had in November. And I think the firming of conditions is more in his favour than it would be some of the others, Bryson and, and DJ in particular. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think he's got an outstanding chance and I'd be very disappointed if he's not in the top 10. I think he, he gained strokes putting in November for the first time. Uh, I'm, I'm right in saying that, uh, you know, do you think that's a sign of him getting, you know, used to the greens or, you know, is November an outlier and, when we come to April again on a, on a firm, fast golf course, we're going to see the same problems with them. That, that's what was in my head. It kind of put me off a little. Yeah, it's definitely the, 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 it's the only real concern I have, you know, apart from the usual concerns around, you know, anything can happen in golf, you know. Um, it's the only real worry I have because, as you said, that was his best putting performance here and, and it was under different conditions. Um, I don't know. I think the greens were softer in terms of uh, receiving the ball. Whether they putted massively differently, I wouldn't be so sure. But I bet it's definitely the main worry. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to take it on board. Because as I, say, I think with JT, um, it might sound silly, but I, I think he could win a Masters without putting well. 
Mm. Um, you know, I think you can win the Masters ranking 40th in putting. Um, any sort of gain on the greens, if he if he produces his best from tee to green, obviously the ideal scenario is he puts quite well, and then we've got a bit of leeway for the odd loose shot. But um, if he hits the balls he did at Sawgrass, I I wouldn't think a bad putting week will keep him out of the top five or six anyway. Um, so so I'm very much pinning my hopes on his long game. I don't want to introduce <laughs> another concern, but it's just a bit of amateur psychology for me, and I'd be interested to know what you think. I mean, you compare the two wins of Thomas and Spieth. <clears throat> Thomas, for obvious reasons, at Sawgrass, he was incredibly emotional afterwards because of, you know, he he lost his grandfather recently. He had the personal issues that were brought upon himself and, and lost a fair few sponsors for that. And you could see the emotional kind of drain afterwards in, in, his, in his reaction and his interview. And understandably I think he didn't really turn up at the match play I, I don't think he was really there after that win polar opposite to Spieth who you kind of it was quite strange to watch Spieth finally win a, a, a tournament three and a half years after Birkdale and it almost felt as if job half done you know this is okay that's that done I've now got to move on to next weekend is there any I mean Thomas is obviously such a great champion and a great winner is there any concern for you that that win at Sawgrass almost took quite a lot out of him yeah, there would be if it was last week. There, there isn't now. Um, yeah. I think an early exit in the match play is no bad thing. Um, certainly in terms of expectation, I think if he goes to the quarterfinals in the match play, he might well have been favourite for this. Um, it, it wouldn't worry me massively. But, you know, the, the, the other thing aside from his putting is that apart from November, there's no doubt he has been somewhat of an underachiever in the majors since he won one. I, I think if you yeah. were to say he'd, he'd win the US PGA in 2017 and not really have a good chance to win one since uh, that's kind of jarring given that he's one of the most prolific players in the sport um but but i think he's getting there because at augusta in november he was he was banging contention um and in the us open he was uh, i think he was the first round leader at winged foot so there's been some certainly towards the end of last year uh, the last two majors we've had he was back where he should be so yeah and i just think augusta's perfect for him i i think look if, if you if you're not bothered about the each way element if you just want to bet win only there are worse things to do than go on the exchange and take him and speak and mm. forgo you win you, your each way part, you know. Um, certainly, if I were to have played one more at the top of the market, it would have been Spieth. Um, but yeah, J, I'm a huge JT fan. I've tipped in the last two Masters. I put him up when he won the US PGA. He's been good to me. And I think that does colour our thinking sometimes rightly or wrongly. <laughs> well, we'll move on now because otherwise we're going to be here probably until play starts on Thursday afternoon. Um, and we're going to talk about a player. I mean, Ben, I've, I've got a bone to pick with you because I'm one of those punters who, when I look through the Masters field, probably the week before, I end up with a long list of about 40. And one player who I was happy to leave off was Rory McIlroy. And then I read your preview and you've made, I mean, it, it felt like a reluctant case, but you've made a pretty good case for why Rory McIlroy is a bet at 18 to 1, three points each way, your second tip. Talk us through it for those who haven't. I mean, you you had your head in your hands when I said it there. I, I feel like <laughs> you can't believe you're doing it yourself, but uh, but talk us through it. Yeah, there is an element of that. Look, um, there's maybe some stubbornness involved here. Um, I, I should say, look, I could. It's probably my weakness as a golf tip, so I could write you a case for any player if you want it. Just send me a name and I'll write you a case. <laughs> right. Um, That's what but, a player by player is. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, look. I guess there are two ways to view it. Let's make no bones about it. I've put Rory up four times this year. He's been expensive and costly uh, and a failure on my part. And I think I got a cup. I think Riviera was a big mistake on my part. I don't think I don't regret putting him up in Phoenix or at the concession, um, but I do, or at the match play actually. But I do regret putting him up at Riviera. So that's that. Um, <sighs> I, I, I have to confess, I struggle with the Masters. I do. I, 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 I think it's very, very difficult to, to, to view the extra places we get. I think it's in some respects, I just wish we got a quarter first five. And, <laughs> you know, we'd just be a little bit, e I think I'd be easier to analyze from my perspective. But that's, that's a personal thing. I know the man in the street punter wants as many places he can get, doesn't mind taking a short price. And I get that. Um, but for me, it, it kind of... Uh, it, it takes away my worries about whether they can go and win the thing. You know, and I think Rory has to play badly to not finish in the top 10. I really do. You know, I mean, he's done it six of the last seven years. And I think Niall will remember 2018 particularly well because he put up Rory to win at Bay Hill um, in the weeks before the Masters. So I think a lot of people think that every time Rory's teed it up in the Masters for these top 10s, he's been one of the best players in the world. You know, one of the best two or three in the world. And well, he wasn't that year. Um, and he could—he was in the final group. It's the best chance he's had since 2011. His form, apart from Bay Hill, where he just putted well, um, 
you know, it was bad. It was worse than it is now. I mean, when you look at his foot, nine of his last 11 stroke play starts, he's finished in the top 25. Mm. If that's Xander Schoffley, we're talking about how solid his form is, but it's Rory McIlroy, and we rightly judge him to a higher standard. I understand that. It's not good enough for Rory McIlroy. It's not good enough that he's not won since 2009. It's not good enough that he's seven years without a major. All that is accepted. But if he plays to his B game around Augusta, he'll place. That's kind of how I see it, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're getting 18 to 1, and I think a lot like Niall said, he made a really good point with Jordan Spieth and how, yeah, it's all very well talking about what price he was in February. We're in April now. Um, and that will be the same for me. Like, it's, it's very easy to say, well, look, I've, I've put him up four times. I was wrong in Phoenix. I was wrong at Riviera. But we, you have to wipe the slate clean, don't you? Because you'd never put anybody up. You know, everybody's going to let you down more than they'll do the job for you in this sport um so look i i think every although i will get most of the you know questioning and criticism rightly because i've been the one who's been wrong on him um whereas other people might be putting him up this week for the first time in two years um i think every good golf tipster will have strongly considered rory mcelroy 18 to 1 whether or not they played him or not um would i prefer the green to be a bit softer yes um but um, the, I, I can buy into being under the radar and look, he finished fifth here in November shooting 75 in round one. If he can just shoot 69 in round one, we'll be away. Um, so <laughs> Thursday is big for Rory McIlroy, arguably for me. And look, if he fails, I'm afraid I probably will have to leave his name out of a few columns for at least a month or two. <laughs> well, after saying every decent tips has considered him, I'm not going to ask Niall uh, if he has. Otherwise, we could come to blows if the case is, is if the case is no. But no, we'll start at the top of the market then. We've got um, DJ, Bryson, John Rahm uh, to get through before we go on to other selections. And I think we'll start with DJ with you because you kind of alluded to the fact that you found him pretty easy to swerve this week. I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening who maybe haven't watched much golf since the November Masters will probably have him pretty high on their list of of players to side with. So um, so what's putting you off DJ for, for this weekend? I think when he won in December or in November, I looked at his price afterwards and you know he was around the seven to one mark and I thought <clears throat> it was very generous after what he had in November. Uh, but since, he just has not been as convincing. Uh, Podden has slightly deserted him over the last couple of months, which would be a big worry for me. Uh, when he was playing so well there towards the back, or in the middle of last year, in the back of the end of last year, he looked so good in the greens. And I think there was a change, obviously. Uh, him in the the caddy were obviously walking around putts like Tiger used to do on his pump. I mean, they were walking around it about five times. The, the amount of time they were taking over putts was unbelievable. But it was resulting in, you know, great putting performances. And that just hasn't been the same lately. Uh, when he actually won in uh, Saudi in the European Tour, he lost strokes putting that week. Uh, he lost strokes at the century. And it's just a big worry for me. And... Kind of the defending champion aspect, although I, I wouldn't necessarily put a huge negative upon uh, defending champions. Uh, it's just that it's such a quick turnaround as well. And when, you're, when you don't have your A game, uh, you're unlikely to find it here at Augusta. Uh, and, you know, he, he's still favourite at the end of the day. And, you know, market wise, I, I don't think it'll talk to many and it doesn't talk to me. What about Bryson DeChambeau, Niall, a player that you've sided with a few times over the, well, since his physical um, physical changes over the past 18 months or so. Uh, and it feels, I mean, Bryson's never quiet, but it feels like he's almost coming into this one as the, as the player being spoken about the least at the top of the market. Certainly wasn't the case back in November. Well, he's found his game again. And, you know, he's the big worry for me. You know, towards the top of the market, I was like, obviously, as we've talked about, I was very close to backing Justin Thomas. But, it was between Spieth, Thomas, and McElroy for me, punted wise. That I was going to go with probably two of the three, and in the end, I just decided to go with one of them because I actually kind of like a few further down the market more than you know that I expected to, and more than uh, just a few at the top. I think they're just better bets. But uh, Bryson's really found his game. He obviously won uh, at the Arnold Palmer and went very close at Sawgrass. Uh, you know, I backed him obviously in November and was very sweet on his chances. But I wasn't, you know, I don't think it was, I wouldn't say I was totally wrong because I still do think that Augusta kind of suits his game. But he drove, the, he didn't drive the ball well and it actually played out for a number of months where he didn't drive the ball well. Mm. Uh, 
thanks Ben back them in Hawaii along alongside me as well. And you know, just a very frustrating watch. Someone who, you know, you were counting on, you know, and gaining so many strokes off the off the tee, and it just wasn't happening back then. But that has changed, and you know, uh, his prowess off the tee is is back in abundance now. And you know, if you can find the fairways around here, you find a lot of chances with with short uh, wedges and the greens. And although that isn't really the strength of his game, it'll all depend on his putting. I think he's lost strokes on the greens every time he's played here, bar November, where he just, you know, he only gained like. Um, Point two of a stroke, I think, for the week in November. He's lost strokes every other year he's played, and that would be the worry for me. It's the kind of thing that's just put me off. I don't know whether he'll hold a putt to actually win the event. Final one from this group of favourites, Ben. Quickly touch on John Rahm, who had a baby in the week or over the weekend, and I know a lot of people will like that baby swag angle, the angle that, you know, guys who turn up at these tournaments having just had a kid can often perform very well we saw Danny Willett do it a few years ago I was very disappointed to learn that the name of John Rahm's kid uh, Kepper Cahill Rahm wasn't a nod to um, his favourite team Chelsea but actually because his wife is just called her maiden name was Cahill uh, which was a bit of a blow I thought it was one of the most niche bits of naming we'd ever seen but uh, but I mean Rahm a guy who whose game should suit Augusta pretty well and uh, and you think if you know, as you mentioned in your column, you think if anyone's going to be suited by having a different perspective on things, uh, John Rahm could be one of those. He certainly could be. And and look, the, the nappy fact is one of those things. You, a lot of people will just ignore it completely. Those who believe it, obviously, you kind of, it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling thing. You know, there are a lot of people who become fathers and do not play any better. There are a lot <laughs> who play worse. Um, so, you know, you, you have to take it as, I would never take it as the basis. And I think hopefully I've underlined that this week. It's never the the, the sole reason um, and and I'm still a little bit worried I know Ram's results remain very strong and very consistent but he's not really had a chance to win this year and for someone who you know he's not won since August for someone who um, was playing at that sort of level that took him to world number one he's not quite on it now I know obviously neither is Rory McIlroy and I, I've put him up at, at four or five points bigger but that really is the key thing had Ram been 18 to one yeah probably probably would have been putting him up but um at the price I I just think there are enough doubts and the the one real negative for me and again it's it's a matter of time and we're talking about a small sample size but he's not really he's not he's been a bit below his best in majors you know he, he topped one here at Saturday uh, in November when he was right in the mix and, and went backwards thereafter. And if you think about John Rahm over the last four years, the one thing he's not done is really been in there pitching for a major. When it, even the USPGA, when he was top five, you know, Kepka was Kepka, Scott and, and Woods were having a battle for that. Really, he was playing for fourth or fifth. Um, and that's kind of odd for a player of his caliber. You know, he started strongly at Port Rush and then stuttered. And there, there, there might be just a thing where he's putting a little bit too ex- much expectation on himself, but he plainly loves Augusta. I, there is not. I, you have to be nitpicky with a player of John Rahm if you want to find the negatives, mm. um, but they are there. We'll get on to the rest of your tips now, and Ben, I'll stay with you. Um, three other selections: Paul Casey each way, one point five points each way at thirty-five to one. Bad news for you, Ben, is that I've already backed him. I'm afraid so you can put a line through that one. Uh, Jason Day, one point each way at fifty-fives, and C Wu half a point each way at 100 to 1. Quickly talk us through the thinking behind those three picks. Yeah, I think Casey, you know, some people think that seems short and I know I think Niall put him up at in Dubai at 25 to 1 and <clears> I do think with the with the majors you, you have to kind of get all that out of your head because we've, we've got 11 places, you know, and particularly Augusta, I think realistically there might be 20 players who can win this and I think that, that you can triple or quadruple that in a US Open. Um, so I, I do think it's a very different tournament to weigh up and, and that's going to be reflected in the market. I think Casey's got a great chance to play well. We we'll worry about whether he can win on Sunday. Um, but I would say, you know, Every player can't win until they win. You know, yeah. there yeah. were people when Jordan Spieth came out on the tour, there were people who said, oh, he's not very good at closing it out. He has so many top tens before he won. And then obviously he was second in his first go at the Masters. Um, it really doesn't take much more than that for people to, to write you off. And, and Augusta in the last few years, we've had Sergio Garcia. Uh, I, you know, it frustrates me every time you get someone tell you, oh, so-and-so can't win a major. Well, you, you would have said that about Sergio Garcia, wouldn't you? And you'd have been wrong uh, because he did. And the same for Adam Scott. And there are there are countless others. Henrik Stenson won one in his 40s. So why can't Paul Casey, right? The, the key for me is that as well as being a great approach player, as well as being fantastic off the tee and, you know, having a game which does obviously translate to Augusta and three top sixes, I think, in the last seven or eight appearances there, um, 
it's only recently that he's looked like he's really ready to win a major. Um, and perhaps that's due to expectations. A couple of years ago, he missed the cut here. Um, and he came, he arrived saying, oh, I've got a massive chance and he missed the cut. Last mm. year, he arrived saying, I need the others to underperform if I'm to win. And that shift in mindset might be the reason why he was so good at the US PGA. And um, when he was beaten by Morikawa, I, I thought he played brilliantly in that. And maybe it was the fact that there were no fans. I don't know. But that's the closest he's come to winning a major despite being in his 40s. So um, I think there is enough evidence to say he could win one. And he's certainly one of the form players on the planet. Um, and that's a nice combination. Jason Day is not one of the form players on the planet, but he has played well at certain courses. And they tend to be the courses where he always plays well at. So Pebble Beach, he was seventh. Sawgrass, he was mid-pack, but he was second in strokes gained tee to green. So had it not been for countless missed putts from five feet, I mean, I'd, I've never seen him miss so many short putts. He could have been in the top 10 there. And that would have been just another hint that he's not far away. And I was actually encouraged by his press conference on Monday as well. Um he loves it or Augusta. If you take away the miscut in November, he's never been outside the top 30. He was second on debut, third on his second completed start. Um, I really like how high he hits the ball uh, from, a, from a more sort of technical point of view. Um, you know, to these firm greens, that's going to be a massive asset. Um, he drove it as well as he has in four years last time. The putter has to come good, um, but hopefully it will. Um, and lastly, Siwoo Kim. I think I was looking for a player who I can... Who do I think is going to be the best iron player this week? If I had to guess, it would be Justin Thomas. I think if I were to price that market up, you'd make Thomas favourite, Morikawa second favourite. Mm -hmm. Now, Siwoo Kim would probably be 10th or so in the betting, but I think of the outsiders, he'd be one of those who he's capable of that field-leading approach play performance. Um, his form in majors and at Augusta is actually quite good. You know, he was on the fringes at Aaron Hills. Um, not the only time he's been on the fringes in a major championship. Uh, Augusta, he's three times just finished a shot or two outside the top 20. To make that leap into the top 10 requires a bit more, but um, he's a winner this year. He's healthy. He's not always been healthy when he's arrived here. He's part of the Claude Harmon stable now. Another, you know, he's just rubbing shoulders with really world-class golfers um, and seeing how they go about things. Um, and look, the youngest ever winner of the Players' Championship, I can believe that he could win a major. Um and yeah, he, he, he was brilliant from Tita Green at Sawgrass. He played okay last week in Texas. So uh, he was the most interesting outsider for me, but I, it wasn't an event where I was particularly enamored with those at three figures, but he, he was definitely the exception. Strong cases for all three. I mean, interesting to note, purely this is, you know, I guess the uh, producer can cut this out if he doesn't like it, but I'm interested because I bat Morikawa and I'm interested to know, I mean, there obviously is the experience angle, but when you're thinking about players who, when they're dialed in, are, are basically top level elite he has to fit that bill so what what made you kind of brush past the idea that you've got a guy at kind of 30 to 1 who you'd have second favorite in the metric that you're kind of most interested in uh partly the, the experience thing partly um the firm greens and, and whether his putting will stand up to it and partly that i've just he's he has put me through the mill he really has <laughs> I, I tipped him at 500 to 1 in the canadian open last summer before last uh, he finished 12th and he could have easily placed, um, you know, three starts later, he wins a Barracuda at 16 to one. Um, I, I put up Justin Thomas against him in the workday last year. Thomas won to 80 with two holes to play and Morikawa beat him. Niall loves him, by the way, because he's been on him for that. And he was on him <laughs> at the concession. It's just, you know, and at the concession, he was, I wrote in my preview at the concession, Morikawa was tempting. And I, I went with Hovland and Kepka who tied second behind him. So he, he has put me through it. Um, um, that's no good reason. I honestly, I could not talk anyone out of him. You're talking 33 to one about a player who has won one in 10 tournaments for two years now, um, on the, on the PGA tour, you know, including a major, including a world golf championship. There is no question. He is good value. Um, I just don't think he'll win. That's good. Normally when I speak about what I, when I talk about what I've, uh, what I've backed someone, normally tells me why it's a terrible bet but luckily there you haven't done that which is good i, th I um, think if, i think if it was any other major other than the masters i think you'd be absolutely busting the bet that price yeah as i said as i mentioned earlier on i think it's just a low fade and the fact that he might leave himself a bit longer yardages although he's very capable of recovering that because we know his game but you know as ben says coming into the, the firm greens he might just be up against it here you know in in firm fast conditions in the april's but on the face of it, as you say, we're number three or four, 33 to one. It's, it seems a bit crazy, yeah. And th there's one other player like that, George, if I can just uh, yeah. add this. It's Tyrrell Hatton. Mm. You know, if there's any, there is no other tournament right now where Tyrrell Hatton can be 55 to one. 
Um, he's world number eight, um, you know. But it's the, the, when we get to Augusta, you just have to. I think people you put things through a slightly different prism, uh, you know. And and it, it's very rare to have not done anything here in the past and come and win the tournament. It's exceptionally rare. Um, so that's against him as well. But I think you know those two uh, compared to their world rankings, it's you know the fact that Lee Westwood's ten points shorter than Tyrrell Hatton. It, it all comes back to Augusta, doesn't it? Um, and probably rightly so, I guess. Well, we'll see. We'll, see. we'll know if rightly so come Sunday. I mean, I, as little in sport, I would love more than to see Lee Westwood slip on a green jacket on a Sunday evening. Um, won't be carrying my money at that price, though, I can assure you. Uh, Niall, on to your selections. Uh, you have four more that you put up, and, and as Ben did, uh, if you rattle through them. So, uh, Joachim Neiman is the next selection, 1.5 points each way at 60 to 1. Paddy Reid at 33 to 1, 1. 1.5 each way. Webb Simpson, 1.5 each way at 40s. And Sungjai, a point each way at 40s too. Take us through him. Well, just to start with the last one there, Sungjai, I think, you know, obviously he finished second, you know, last year, which is a really surprising result for someone with no, with no experience around Augusta. Uh, you know, obviously he came out on top on uh, Dave Tindall's trends piece, which mm. uh, only kind of, I'm not a trends man really, but I was reading it thinking, I was already thinking of back in Sungjai and then, yeah, that kind of put the nail on that there, that it was going to continue with that uh, train of thought. Uh, you know, obviously he's a top class golfer, we know that, and he's capable of winning a major, and probably capable of winning a major maybe before uh, many think that that he would do. It's still very early on in his career, obviously he won the Honda, and uh, he defended it quite well a couple of weeks ago, he finished in the top 10, again playing well. Uh, whether the November Masters things come back comes back to bite me, and you know, that it wasn't really anything to put too much weight on is another aspect but I think each way with the places on offer you know it's a solid enough bet uh, he pots quite well there's just no real weakness to his game and around Augusta he could become a specialist over the next number of years he you know he hits a high ball flight into these greens which is beneficial this week so uh, I kind of hope to get a bigger price about him I don't think many will be over enamored about his price but uh Nevertheless, I think that there's he's one that could go well, and you know, obviously, another uh, golf writer that we usually talk about in reading articles. Matt Cooper has talked about the base camp theory down the last number of years, and uh, Song Jay finishing second last uh, November is just perfect for that. Uh, so yeah, uh, Joaquin Neiman, uh, I think he's really talented young golfer and he's obviously won once on the PGA Tour Greenbrier and it's a stretch maybe to think that he could win the Masters but uh, Data Golf uh, did a study in the you know the, the correlation between distance and performance here at Augusta uh, and a couple of years ago when they came to the conclusion that every eight yards of length that you gain is worth half a shot around and um, I was just surprised. Joaquin Neiman would never have struck me as one of the longest golfers in the game. Mm. And I was surprised when I went to check it. He's in the top 10 driving distance this season. Uh, averaging, averaging 312 yards off the tee. He averaged, he averaged 300, 301 last year. So he's gained 12 yards. And that's an awful lot for, especially a golfer, of Joaquin Neiman's build. He's strong and he's, he, he has a fast swing. But uh, he's only played here once and he missed the cut. I think he shot eight or nine over. But he played well, very, very well earlier on in the year in Hawaii. He was a very unlucky loser to Harris Angus at the centre. And showed great character the following week, going out in Hawaii again and nearly winning the Sony, finishing second to Kevin Nader. So his form is, kind of isn't the same as what it was at the start of the season. But nevertheless, I think he's a lively outsider. He could go well. Uh, the other tips, Paddy Reid kind of speaks for itself. I just think... You know, I don't really have much reasoning behind Paddy Reid bar's price. I think he's just too big, around 33 to 1. Uh, he always plays well here now in the last two or three years. I think he's got the hang of it. Uh, with the firm greens, I think there's going to be plenty of guys missing greens and maybe short game would uh, rank possibly higher than what it has done in previous years, especially in November. But he performs well year on year now and a short game does 
proved to be very important over the weekend, which it always really does at Augusta, but maybe this year more than usual. Paddy Reid's top of that list. Uh, he shows he's he has showed what he can do in big championships. He is, you know, if he gets anywhere near the lead or if he gets that lead, he is hard to beat. You know, he broke my heart last year. Was it the PGA when he grabbed the lead? Was it the mm. PGA or the US Open? PGA, I think. I think so. And then he was very disappointing, you know, over the last 27 holes. Uh, and that was kind of one of the only real times I can remember ever getting to the lead and uh, kind of faltering. You know, he's a great front runner, but uh, yeah, I just think he's too big of a price this week, and that was the main reason for going in. And Webb Simpson, you know, I've backed him each way, and I've backed him. Uh, on the exchange as well. I think he's just he's going off in the exchange twice the price than what he did in November. Mm. It just doesn't quite add up to me. Uh you know, Ben mentioned that, you know, having the longer clubs into these greens might not be a, might not be great over the week with how firm they are and how, how much you're gonna get up and need to get up and down. But he's a great putter and he's shown that he can do it in both uh both formats here at Augusta, you know, obviously finished, I think he finished 10th last year in November, a slightly softer Masters. We finished 5th the year before, you know, in April, and it was slightly harder, faster conditions then. Uh, I think he's 22 under par for his last three efforts here at Augusta. Just don't quite get that drift. Again, it's kind of the price that's enticed me in. Uh, that's kind of why I've, I've sacrificed uh going with two from the top, which I always kind of thought that I, I would be doing this week. Uh, Patrick Reid and, and Webb Simpson just have drifted to a mark that just doesn't quite make sense to me. And I, and I expect that one of them, at least, to contend over the week. And I'd be surprised if one of them doesn't really at least threaten, but probably get in that top 10 or 11 where you get profit on either two of the bets. Great stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of players you guys think are worth taking on at the prices. I'm just going to rattle through a few more of the players you haven't mentioned and their prices. Cantlay, I mentioned, is 22 to 1. Uh, Xander Shoffley is 25 to 1. Brooks Kepka, 28 to 1. Looks set to play despite only having knee surgery a few weeks ago. Uh, Colin Morikawa, I mentioned, is 33 to 1. Victor Hovland, 33s. Tony Finau, 35 to 1. Daniel Berger, 40 to 1. Cam Smith, 40s. Lee Westwood, 40s. Uh, Hideki Matsuyama, 45s. Scotty Scheffler, 50s. Matt Fitzpatrick, the only other player that I've backed playing some cracking stuff at the moment 50 to 1 uh Sergio and Tommy Fleet with both 55 to 1 Louis Tays and 66s and a few bigger there as well Ben any for you that you're, you're looking at and you think you just can't really get on board with them and therefore kind of are there, are there any sub markets that we could get into in order to maximize uh, those views there really weren't a lot at the top of the market, I, I was dead against. Um, I did call massively on Patrick Cantlay, who I think a week ago I would have told you would have been in my staking plan. So I've called on him quite a lot. Mm. Finau is interesting because um, he drove the ball terribly last week yeah. in Texas, as bad as he's driven it in many years. Um, that would be a real alarm bell for me, um, and the faster greens would as well. So I could probably um, oppose Finau. Obviously, you're talking about one of the most consistent players in the in the game bar Bar the wins column. Um, um, and, you know, he does need to drive it better. Um, but it wouldn't be a massive surprise if he did that. But I'd, I'd be fairly cool on him. I think Lee Westwood is underpriced. You know, some 28 to 1 around. I think I, that's very short. <laughs> yeah. um, but obviously, there's it'd be a much bigger price on the exchange. It's not like it's something you can necessarily frame uh, bets around. At bigger prices, though, I think if you look at Westwood and consider that he might be too short, if you do take the view that Tyrrell Hatton um, has a problem either in majors in general or at Augusta. And then you remember that the last time we saw Justin Rose, it was withdrawing from um, Bay Hill. You know, didn't play in the Players' Championship, didn't play in the match play, although I'm not even sure he qualified for that this year. Um, but I think you can ob obviously make a case to take on Justin Rose. Then all of a sudden, you, you've got three of the, the obvious players in the, the top Englishman market um, to be taken on. One, the, one of the others is an amateur who, who's going to struggle. So, you know, whether it's Fleetwood or Fitz or Casey or maybe Poulter, um, I'd certainly be looking at Fleetwood, Fitz and Casey as the three most likely there. You could get creative and be be putting a few of those together and getting even money against the rest or whatever it may be. Um, that might be something you could look to do. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, the market is so stacked towards Augusta um, comfort that, that it becomes quite difficult to see where the, the obvious problems are. I mean, for example, Hideki Matsuyama is underpriced on on form 
Mm. But he always plays well at Augusta. Uh, is whether you want to be taking on a player like that. I mean, he was he was hopeless last week after a good start when I was on him at a shorter price. So, um, you know, we'll see how he plays this week. But he'd be one, you know, top Asian market, maybe take on Hideki. He's dominated it in the past, but I could certainly take Sung, Sung Jae Im and Siwoo Kim against him this time. Yeah, so in the in the top English market there, you've got Paul Casey, the four to one favourite, Matt Fitzpatrick five to one. There's a most with most firms, Tommy Fleetwood eleven to two, with Unibet, Betfred, and Boyles, and you're getting uh, a quarter of the three with Skybet, Paddy Power, Hills, eight eight eight, and Betfair and Betfred fifth of three, though with the three six five. Uh, I should say Betway and, Bet- and Ball Sports also a quarter of the three. So some interesting each way angles there. Kind of goes back to being a bit of a dead eight horse race for that one. I think you can almost back. Casey Fitz and Fleetwood each way and you probably wouldn't be far off uh, making profit come the end of it um, and then in the top Asian market as well as Ben just flagged up uh, you've got Hideki and well Sung- Sungjae and Hideki kind of almost vying for favouritism uh, if you're looking at best prices Sungjae 11 to 8 uh, Hideki 15 to 8 best price although he's as short as 7 to 5 uh, with Hill Siwoo is 9 to 2 and CT Pan is 15 to 2 so a four runner race uh, for the top Asian market Niall, any you're looking to swerve and, and any ways that we can uh, yeah we can we can punt those on these uh, top nationality markets. Well, one sub market that I quite like, but the, the one fade towards the top of the market that you know doesn't influence the sub market. Better Sanders Shofla, it's what he's one that just doesn't interest me this week. Uh, this game's kind of gone off the board since the Genesis a couple of months ago. Uh, finished thirty ninth at the concession and missed the cut at Sawgrass. Uh, he hasn't won now in two and a half years since uh, the century in Hawaii in 2019. So it's unlikely that, that you know, he, he's going to win this week. Uh, he's just won. He hasn't really drifted to a back of a market either. <clears throat> one towards the top of the market that I'd like to swerve. Sub markets wise, uh, you just mentioned them there. In the top of the Asian market, CT Pan. I think he might be worth, you know, as Ben says, Hideki is. Can be slightly opposed to that performance last week. Uh, he was very. Uh, there was plenty of people who were on. Uh, he was very disappointed after getting into a good position. Uh, so CT Pan in the top rest of the world market, which most bookmakers have priced. I think he, I think there's 33 to one out there. Uh, he obviously finished seventh last year on his debut. Uh, finished third at the Honda last time out, so he's in good form. I think there's plenty of things pointing that, you know. CT Pan's form is not a fluke, and you know, 33 to 1. There's plenty of guys in that rest of the world market who aren't entirely convincing, like Louis Hughes and other South Africans. Uh, you know, Sung Jae and, and Hideki, even though I fancy Sung Jae to well, but they're very short in that, in that market, in my opinion, and could be worth taking on. I think CT Pan at 33 to 1 is one of the more interesting sub market bets for the week. And obviously, Sander is my favorite towards the top, and I don't like can't lay either. I'll hunt, I'll, I'll harp on about this for as long as I can. I harped on about Matsuyama for years <laughs> when George, you were backing him in the Masters yeah. every single year. He was underpriced. <laughs> I think can't lay is underpriced every single week. He tees it up, and uh, he just hasn't convinced me of it either. So he possibly be another favorite towards the top of the market. Would you be looking at backing Spieth at eight to one and top top American if you're taking out can't lay and Zander? You know, you're getting four places. There are five places with uh, with Boyles. Who? Spieth. Spieth? Well, I mean, he's, he's, one. A, yeah. he's a headline selection. So you, you've got DJ 7 to 1, Bryson 15 to 2, JT 8 to 1, Spieth 8 to 1, Cantley 14, Zander 14. Yeah, certainly. I wouldn't put anybody off doing that. Uh, you know, I, th- I, th- I think Spieth goes well. I, th- I just don't think, you know, can anybody say, you know, people are talking about, oh, it's going to go, it's, it's going to go horribly wrong for Spieth backers when he ends up 50th and ends up in all the <laughs> trouble in the trees. He's, he's, playing, he's playing that well. But, you know, I think he's just an absolute certainty to contend. I think it's an absolute certainty. Now, you've closed off the podcast and video by saying he's an absolute certainty to contend. I'm sure they'll be taking that out of context. Uh, thanks very much to both Niall and to Ben uh, for joining me, uh, for joining us today. I should say, make sure you follow Ben uh, at Ben Coley Golf on Twitter and Niall at Bet Golf World as well. Loads of brilliant content before the event loads of brilliant content during the event and also throughout the golf season as well two of the absolute must follows uh, for any golf fans out there um, and a pleasure to be joined by you both today fingers crossed for you both 
that uh, followers of your tips will be in profit come Sunday evening. And hopefully we flagged up a couple of winners on this podcast today. Do download the Odds Checker app for the very best prices. Bookie offers free bets, tipsters and place terms as well. Do gamble responsibly and most importantly, enjoy the weekend's action from Augusta.